Hello, folks. It is Wednesday night Bible study. I'm glad to be back with you. We had a great uh, few days off. It was nice doing something a little different and back with you and back in 1 Peter. So you got your Bibles turned to 1 Peter 3, and we will look hopefully be at verses 13, 14, 15, 16, and maybe 17. Hey, we're going to do a bunch tonight. So get your Bibles and let's study together, shall we? Um, love the study. Love the challenges of the study. Remember, real quick overview, review. Um, Peter is writing to Christians who are struggling with doubts about what's happening to them in their life and where is God? Uh, where's my hope? I thought God would be around and take care of my situation. And it's one of those things we struggle with all the time, right? It has never left us because we live not by faith, but by sight. Now, we're supposed to live by faith and not by sight. But let's be honest. We live most of the time by sight. And we evaluate God's love for us based upon what we see happening in our life. That's our struggle. And it's a real struggle. Does that make us bad people? It makes us people, all right? God knew what he was doing when he created us, knowing that we would turn our backs upon him, that he would cost him his very life through his son, that he would die for our sin so that we would receive his righteousness. I love the picture that uh, is painted in the Garden of Eden. The temptation, can you imagine? I, I can't. I really can't imagine the overwhelming temptation, as, as one writer said, is, is in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus looks over the pit of hell and feels the flames and the heat of Satan. You remember three times Jesus asked, Father, if you could take this cup of judgment away from me. And, yet, and three times the response is, but not my will, but thy will be done. And all this time, the picture that I see of Jesus going through incredible agony. Temptation was overwhelming to say, let's forget this. The picture outside that prayer time and the temptation were the sleeping disciples whom Jesus had said, please stay with me. Stay alert. My soul is in agony. I'm experiencing death. That's what he said. And what do they do? Yeah, go ahead. We'll be right there. We're with you all the way. Jesus three times comes and wakes them up. Three times. They couldn't keep their eyes open. And won't, don't you think, don't you know, that in the temptation he could hear Satan saying, and this is what you're going to the cross for? Are you sure? Look at these men. They can't even keep their eyes open. You see, God knew, Jesus experienced, obviously, what kinds of people he was going to give up his life for. It wasn't for the noble and for the and for the well uh, healed and 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 those that were able to it was it was for all of us the poor the needy the absolutely unable to take care of ourselves kinds of people so that's the kind of people that we are living by sight not by faith and yet the call of scripture and the call of the writers of the New Testament, Peter, as he's talking, saying, guys, 
Don't live that way. Don't adjust your life around sight, but instead adjust your life around faith. Jesus, in the, in the um, boat, when the storm came up, and he calms the storm, you remember he turns to the disciples and said, where is your faith? He doesn't say, you need more faith. He says, what are you doing with the faith that you already have? What are you doing with the truth of who you know that I am? You're not doing anything with it. You're letting it recede to the background and you're letting your fears go to the foreground and you are not doing any, where is your faith? And he, can, he says the same thing to us. When we struggle, when we question, when we doubt, when we're angry because things are not working out the way we think that they should work out, it's not that we need more faith, it's that we need to work out the faith that we already have. We need to get into scripture. We need to get on our knees. We need to talk with others. We need to hear, <coughs> we need to hear affirming words through sermons, through studies. By the way, I understand that our C4 class, led by uh, Derek and Joy, are doing a Facebook uh, Live or Facebook page or something on Sunday nights talking about the sermon. I think that's fantastic because that's what we need. How do we bring faith to the forefront and fear to the background? It is when we apply faith, when we live by faith and not by sight, instead of the opposite, we live by sight and not by faith. Paul David Tripp, guy that I quote quite often because he's got such a great way with words, in, I think it was either today's or yesterday's devotional, he's, the, the heading is a question. Will your responses today be shaped more by fear of your inability or by celebration of Christ's sufficiency? Let me say it again because it's a great question. Will your responses today be shaped more by fear of your inability, of your inability, or by celebration, that's worship, of Christ's sufficiency. We live by sight and not by faith. Where's your faith? That's the question. It's a tough one. But it's one that we need to evaluate and work on every day. Faith is not magic. It doesn't all of a sudden bibbity boppity boo and you're all good and the life is wonderful and everything works out to your favor and that's garbage that's the american gospel that's the gospel of triumphalism and success and that's not scripture i'm sorry it just isn't scripture says you're going to slug through life by faith and it's going to be difficult but you'll make it because of Christ's sufficiency. Now, what are you going to depend on? What are you going to let rule your life? Well, that's where we are in, in 1 Peter. He is writing to people who are saying, I don't know what's going on in my life. It's not right. Things aren't, doing, aren't happening as they should. I prayed, I prayed, I've worked, I've been faithful, I've given, I've done all these things. And yet, look what's happening. And so Peter hits it head on. He's been talking about the various rules for household and how we live our lives. And now he's going to get right into the midst of it. After he has quoted <clears throat> from Isaiah, he's going to go back to Isaiah again. Let's look in verse 13. He starts off with a question. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? Now, we're just going to stop there for a second. Because if you stop there, 
You say, well, wait a second. If I, if I do good, then I should not experience harm, right? You know what it says? Who then will harm you if you're devoted to good? If you are zealots, if you follow, if you're devoted to good, do, life should work out. Isn't that what it's saying? Here we get into a bit of a problem sometimes. Now, it's, he's going to follow this up with the opposite in just a moment. But man, this is one of those uh, promise box verses. It's easy to put in our lives when we say, wait a second. If I do good, I should not experience harm. So I'm going to do good. That'll be my little motivation. Uh, careful of your motivation. A lot of times our motivation to do good is so that we are experiencing good for ourselves. I'll do good, therefore I'll get good. And the reasons you do it is not because it's motivated by the love of Christ. It's motivated by your own ambition to be okay with yourselves. Am I right? I will do good so others will treat me good. And it says here, what harm will come to you if you're devoted to good? It is like a proverb. Now, here is one of the things about proverbs. You need to look at them very carefully. Proverbs and things in Scripture, generally speaking, when it's, when it's these kinds of things, is either a principle or it's a promise. And here we see this, I see it as a principle. Many of the things in Scripture, especially in Proverbs, are principles, not a promise. Now, a promise is if you do this, this is going to happen. That's a promise. A principle says, in general, when you do the right things, no harm will come to you. Now, that makes sense. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you obey the traffic laws, speed, speed limit, passing when you're supposed to, uh, not running red lights, stopping for a stop sign, those kind of things. If you do those things, do you get in trouble if you do them? Principally, no. But does that mean that if you follow all those rules, you'll never get into a wreck? Well, you know that's not true. You see? It might be that you follow all the rules, and if you, now I go the opposite. If you speed, if you don't stop at red lights, if you run through stop signs, will harm come to you? Probably. Certainly much more likely than if you follow those laws of the land. Correct? So the principle is if you do the right thing, you won't get an accident. But it's not a promise because it's still possible for this to happen. I want to focus in on what's your motivation. If you're just doing good, so good will happen to you, that's a selfish motivation. That's selfish. We're going to see that in a second. So, principle versus promise. I think that's really important. To, the distinction is important in verse 13. He, he follows it up immediately, but even if, but even if, you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated. So there's a big conjunction, but, B-U-T, but even if you should suffer for righteousness, in other words, if you do the right things, if you treat people right, if you're honest, if, you are, if you're a man and woman of integrity, if you, um, if you love others and, and they don't love you back, even if you do the right things and you still suffer. You see, here's the problem. What's happening with the church in 1 Peter, and it's happening, it happens with you and me. It happens with the church as well, and Christians in general, especially in world, parts of the world where Christianity is dangerous to have as a witness. 
many parts of India, China, other places around the world. He's talking specifically to them. He said, he's really, I think for you and me, it's like someone didn't smile at me when I smiled back and therefore I'm being persecuted or I said something and they didn't like what I said and I'm being persecuted. It's not exactly the same thing, is it? You know, I, I spoke the gospel truth and my family was killed. Now, there you go. I, I, I spoke about the truth of Jesus Christ and I went to my work and my work said, you're, you're done here. That's a problem. I say, that, that's what they're experiencing. Now, it's going to get a whole lot worse after Peter wrote this, but they're beginning to feel the beginnings of it. And he says, you may do the right things for the right reasons, not selfishly, but you do them righteously. You do them because this is honoring God, honoring Christ. And if you suffer for righteousness, here's what he says. Do you believe this? You are blessed. Uh, I don't know about that. It doesn't feel like I'm blessed. I, I like it a whole lot better when I am blessed and I do things right and I get things right back to me. And people pat me on the back and they like me because I, I, was, an, I was a good person. <clears throat> Listen to Jesus. Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, verse 11. You are blessed when they insult you and persecute you, persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Not because of you, but because of me. Be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus said that. Peter had been sitting there. <clears throat> I could imagine Peter was saying, mm, I don't think so. I don't, I, nice, nice words, Jesus. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Because I think if, if you are the son of God, and I believe you're the son of God, then you're going to do the right by us, and we're going we're gonna to do well in your kingdom, and it's going to be fantastic, wonderful, unbelievable, great, Whatever you, it's going to be that way. I can't believe that we're going to experience um, persecution. In fact, you remember what happened to Peter, right? When Jesus is arrested, Peter follows at a distance. And when Peter has an opportunity to stand up for Jesus, he absolutely denies him three times. Why? Fear. And, and that's why he says this. That's why he says this. If you suffer for righteousness, you're blessed. Do not fear or what they fear or be intimidated. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated. I want you to think for a second. Peter, when he denied Jesus, he saw... Peter, he saw Jesus being persecuted and led away by the, by the very same people that just a matter of, of a couple of months, Peter was standing before that tribunal, Sanhedrin, Roman soldiers, the whole thing. And instead of being in fear, he stands and boldly proclaims Jesus Christ. What's the difference? Real simple, resurrection. Resurrection changed everything. And they begin to understand this was Jesus. And Jesus, if he conquers death, we have nothing to fear. Because if all they hold over us is death, so what? To die is to be in the presence of the one that I'm devoted to with all my being and desire to be with for all eternity. That's it. Therefore, since Jesus has conquered death, I will not fear. And so he says, don't fear what they fear or be intimidated. He, by the way, is quoting from Isaiah chapter 8. Could I read it to you? The second part of chapter uh, 8, verse 12, the second part of that verse. He says, do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. 
You are to regard only the Lord of, of armies as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held in awe. And so Peter takes that and he says, do not fear what they fear or be, who is they? That's people outside of God, outside of Christ. What are they fearing? They're fearing, fearing others. They're fearing position. They're fearing their reputation. And they're fearing death. Everything is revolving around them. He said, don't fear what they fear. Because resurrection means it's over. In Christ, we're conquerors. More than conquerors. Verse 15. But in your hearts, and this is where, again, he takes a little bit of that Isaiah chapter 8. But he, he changes around this a little bit. It's wonderful. Watch it now. But in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. In your hearts, regard, in, in Isaiah it said, regard law, the Lord. But here he, he changes it. And he says, Christ the Lord. He's making a, a ma majestic statement here. Most important, he's saying that Jesus Christ is God. That's what he's saying. The, the deity of Christ is very loudly proclaimed here. He said, but in, in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy. Now, that's the most, that's the most interesting passage. He's saying, in other, in, in other translations, in your, in your hearts, sanctify Christ the Lord as holy. Does that, does that set off any bells there? Because most scriptures say, you be sanctified as holy. We know what sanctify means, it means set apart set apart for uh, ultimate purpose. And the ultimate purpose is to be in the, in the hands of God. <clears throat> Holy. He's saying, we usually think of sanctify yourselves. Set yourselves apart. But here, Peter is saying, sanctify Christ the Lord as holy. What does that mean? Well, you remember Jesus when he was doing the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Hallowed. Hallowed. What does that mean? It means special. It means unique. It means worship. It means sanctification. It means all those things. It means that when I proclaim the name of God, that says, that is the ultimate in everything I believe. That is the ultimate in my desires. That is the ultimate in my hopes. He's hallowed. He's, he's holy in my life. And what difference does that make? It makes a huge difference. If God is ultimate, if he is supreme in your life, then there is nothing that can move you. Do you understand that? I don't understand it as well as I should. Can you be honest? When you anchor onto anything in your boat, I've mentioned this a, oh, some months ago. When you anchor onto a, uh, your boat in a, in a large lake or out in the ocean and you want it to be anchored so you don't drift off into the abyss, you don't anchor it into the water. Why? Because there's nothing that's solid about the water. You don't anchor it onto a twig. Why? Because there's nothing solid about that twig. You anchor it all the way to the bottom onto a rock that is immovable. And now you're immovable and you're safe. And he is saying, if you have Christ the Lord as the ultimate rock of your life, the cornerstone, he's used that earlier, of your life, you are immovable no matter what happens to you. Isn't that great? That's making Christ the Lord holy, sanctified, the only place. Don't put something up. 
Remember, go, go back to what David, uh, David Michael uh, Tripp said. Will your responses today be shaped more by fear of your inability or the celebration of Christ's sufficiency? In other words, will he be holy in your life? Will he be the ultimate? Will the resurrection and the truth of the resurrection resonate so much in your life that you say, even if the very worst happens, I will be in the very presence of the one that I've given my life for. And then he says, be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's within you. He said, make it so real and so understandable that if someone says, I don't get you, you seem to be anchored to a rock. I don't get it. The life around you is a mess, but you seem to be okay. And you say, let me tell you about my hope. And he says, the reason for the hope, that word is apologia, which we get the word ap ap apologetics from. It is giving, giving reasons why you believe. Well, you don't just say, well, I feel like it. You need to begin to understand why you believe what you believe so that you can share that with other people. Now, that can lead to an arrogance. Hmm? Some say, oh, I'm a believer and you're not, and you're going to go to hell, and I'm not. There can become an arrogance, a, a, a prideful thing about this. There's nothing prideful about what has been done for you on your behalf. You had nothing to do with it. And so he says, yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that when you're accused, those who disparage the, your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame do you hear that? Um, he's saying you do it with a gentleness and with a respect. That respect, the word is phobos, it's fear, but it's not, obviously it's not fearing them, but it's that kind of reverence of God so much that you're going to respect others. He's been talking about that, how we deal with each other. And he does it with a clear conscience. It's so interesting. Uh, could I read you a, a, a definition from Baker's uh, Evangelical Dictionary New Testament Theology? It says, a conscience is a God-given capacity for human beings to exercise self-critique. The conscience does not dictate the content of right or wrong. It merely witnesses to the value, what the value system in a person has determined is right or wrong. In this regard, conscience is not a guide, but needs to be guided by a thoroughly and critically developed value system. You see, Jiminy Cricket had it all wrong. You don't let conscience be your guide because conscience is not holy. And a conscience is only what you believe to be right. And if you're not teaching your conscience as what is right and who Christ is and what he's done and what he is expecting out of your life, and that becomes our beliefs, then we can have a clear conscience because we understand not what I think is right, but what we know that Christ is expecting from us. How do we know that? Holy Spirit. Man, we, if, if there's a doubt, we need to say, God, reveal to me where I am wrong in this. We do it in a, not a prideful way, but in a humble way, in a gentle way. That's why we don't come up to somebody and wag a finger in their face and say, this is what you need to believe, but rather we, we do it gently. Then the last part of this, for it is better to suffer for what is good, doing good, than it is if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. He sums it all up, he says, it's better, it's not good, he says, I don't want you to suffer uh, evil. He said, I don't want you to suffer bad things when you're doing good. But if that's God's will, if God's in the middle of it, that's better for you. How do you know God's in the middle of it? Well, Jesus' words. If you experience all these things, insults for my sake, not because you've been bad and you've made bad decisions and, and you've been arrogant and prideful and 
and now people don't like you and they don't want to be around you. That's not what we're talking about. But if you've done good things, gentle things, loving things, and you've suffered the results of that, bad consequences. God must be in the middle of it. God, what are you, what are you teaching me right now? God, what are you, where are you leading me right now? God, what do you want me to do right now? If God's in the middle of that, then we are going to say, your will, your direction, I trust in you. I want to pick that verse up next week, and we're going to move into the last part of that. So I'll, tell, I'll have more to say on verse 17 next week, because I think it's a profound verse. But right now, I want to end. 30 minutes, can you believe it? Jim, it's possible. All right, see you guys later. Bye-bye.